Yeah. Uh, just moved to Clovelly. Have you uh, gone out there and packed a couple on the sl- on the slab out the front there in Gordon's Bay on your, your 10 footer? <laughs> nah, I just go and battle it out, play 10 pin bowls with everyone at Bondi. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They got, ten- they got 10 pin bowling down there now. No, like they're the pins and I'm the ball. <laughs> <laughs> well pond. Yeah. I get it. My skull was one of those balls as a 12 year old. Yeah. Got me good. That English backpacker got me good. Couple nights in intensive care. Thank you, sir. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's probably a lot more crowded now than it was then. It's full of people with their just cracking you across the ankles. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what's happening? How's things? Yeah, good. Um, just insanely busy. My hands ache from typing too much day in and day out on the keyboard. Mm. Um, and yeah, just about to release my new film, Yammer. So that's been a pretty mammoth project. Um, I'm pretty happy and excited to be seeing that come out into the world. Yeah. Talk to us about it. I mean, you far out. You couldn't be further from Ghana right now. You're in Clovelly, uh, you know, typing away in the comforts of air conditioning in a minimally decorated freaking office. Uh, but it wasn't that long ago. You were schlepping your way through Ghana with a 10 foot surfboard and, uh, yeah, just really looked like an amazing trip. I watched the film. Super interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed, you know, just the insight into the, the history and culture of the place and, um, yeah, just a, it was a, a, a nice uh, vignette, I guess, of, of a, a, a pretty pretty unknown place in terms of most surfers' lives. Yeah, it's, um, it, was a really, it was a really interesting trip. I wouldn't say it was an easy trip, um, like a logistically challenging place, definitely, and, um, like, it ca- basically came about because... Um, Project Blank approached me and said that they wanted, they had some budget for me to make a film. And I'd never made a film before or really, yeah, like I've been in some projects, but I'd never been part of actually like producing a project. So naturally I chose the most difficult, expensive, (laughs) challenging um, sort of, Thing that I could possibly do which was to go to Ghana for two and a half weeks and meet up with a crew of female surfers and skaters and um and shoot with them so it's yeah it's it was it was pretty um different to how I expected I think like Accra the city is the capital city is like super modern really fast um a lot of yeah, it seems like it's it's quite a big kind of cultural hub there in a way and what the skaters are doing and they've got this skate park there in the city, it's it's really interesting and very innovative and very creative and they're really building something that you can really see what what that it's it's really kind of um it's not just a skate park, you know, they're they're building like a hub and a creative center. They've got a recording studio there, they were opening that while we were over there and They've had like these big like US rappers come and hang out at the skate park. Actually, when we were there, Usher was playing um, at a Stormzy and Usher were playing at a gig in Accra. So it was pretty like pumping kind of place. And then going regionally, like the difference was just so stark. There's so there some somebody told us that the government only fixes the roads ahead of elections. So that's like really etched into my memory is how slow you have to drive because of all the potholes. And it was like the end of wet season. So there's, there's so much rain. Um, and the yeah, the villages along the coast, just so different, like very um, kind of pretty quiet, very um, like l- slow kind of living, I think, along those areas, but pretty amazing coastline, um, pretty hot and steamy and tropical and some really really cool point breaks and um yeah far cry from being here in sydney (laughs) definitely yeah mondo sea change talk to us a bit about the history of ghana like 
Uh, it's interesting because the Ghanaian diaspora, like it's all through the UK in particular. I guess it was a, a British colony for a period, and you have a lot of high end football players, uh, rappers of Ghanaian ancestry. Um, and I guess um, as a result of that kind of back and forth over the years, it, it's got quite a, a liberal edge to it in some ways, but then it's also got its like traditional. Uh, it's very Christian, isn't it? Like in parts, I, I got that from the film, it seemed, you know, uh, which can bring with it a pretty baffling layer of uh, enforced modesty and all kinds of weird shit, really. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know a whole lot about Ghana apart from its um, its football team. Uh, and, 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 yeah, that's about all I know. Uh, but I imagine what, what did, is that where Patrice Lumumba was from? Isn't he um, Congo? You mean the the president, the socialist president who got yeah, assassinated? could no, be. He was, he was Congo. Yeah, he right. Was Way yeah. off. Now Ghana was so Ghana was the first independent independent Black African nation. So they turfed out the colonizers in 1957 and have since just been like through the mass operation of peeling back the layers of colonization that still hang around. Um, so basically like their history is that they were first, it was the first Europeans to arrive with the Portuguese in the 1400s. They started to trade um, and there was already kind of like um, Muslim influence in the region because of the, because they had gold and salt. So they were tr trading with the Arabs. And then the Portuguese arrived and um, and then the Dutch came followed, following them and finally in the 1600s, the British came. And um, so at that time it was called the, the Gold Coast and it was basically like the heartland of the transatlantic slave trade. So they would bring slaves in from the whole region or captured people from the whole region and lock them in these big, um, huge forts in horrible conditions and then load them onto ships and take them across to um, the Americas to work on the plantations and the other the other projects they had there. So that um, is a history that, I mean, it's pretty dark and it's um, it was interesting to kind of like we went into a slave ward and had a tour and, um, yeah, to kind of see people that have come from being in, you know, like the... the um, the legacy or the the kind of history of that and then to be building something that is like you know overall Ghana is a very like there's a real attitude of like fierce um self-determination and freedom and there's a real rhetoric around freedom for a lot of people there um I think I sort of forgot what your question was but <laughs> oh yeah you answered it I was just looking for a, a general historical overview um Mate, talk to us about some of the people that populate that surf scene, some of the characters. Yeah, so Justice is a guy who we met um, who lives in this little town called Buzwa, which is where we hung out. And so he, him and his mates, they have a surf school um, and they do like surf camps and stuff. So they take people along the coast and they're kind of like driving a lot of the little, um, like the local surf culture that's, that's going on there and so they started they were surfing justice was surfing for years um until he kind of realized that um there were no girls in the water so he went into the village um into his village and basically like recruited some girls to teach them to surf like spoke to their parents and he said that the real there was a real fear that like they didn't know how to swim so the first thing that they did was give some of the girls swimming lessons um and then and then from there started to get them on surfboards and every day after school they'll do like it's like an after school program they'll do like fitness classes and stuff and justice will um I was like how do you know what what sort of surf specific training that you're doing he's like oh, I just look it up on YouTube and just yeah, like, dude. and it worked that guy was ripped out <laughs> dude he was so jacked I couldn't believe it and then he's got the young girls doing squats with medicine balls and shit. And I'm like, fuck, this guy's on one. Look at this guy. He's training the next bloody world champs. What a legend. I know, I know. And, like, it was really cool, actually. Like, I kind of thought that the girls were going to be, like, beginners, you know? 
um, I prejudged that. But then when I got there, like, every, I really noticed how good everyone could read the waves, like, really good at positioning themselves. And, like, the beachy there where they surf is, like, basically a, just a straight hand off. And, like, everyone was so good at, at finding the right waves and being in the right spot. And I thought that was really cool. And then so we were hanging out with the girls when they finished school, but during the day we just, like, went and checked out some other spots with Justice and he kind of like surf guided us basically. And um, yeah, it was really fun. It's funny. There's like, not the kind of like sort of collective um, like knowledge of surf, of surf spots and surf conditions that happens over generations in a place, you know, like in Sydney, you know, you learn from someone who's surfed in a place for a long time, what it's like when a place is good. And they learn from somebody who's surfed that place for a long time before, but these guys, they're like the first people surfing there, you know? So that there's just kind of like, you like hike into this spot and it's like so hot and you're like walking through the prickly jungle. And then it's like, Oh, wrong swell direction <laughs> or something. Like you think, Oh, there's a lot of swells so this will be working. And then you get there and like, it's not, so it's sort of like it's very early in that sense but it was cool because like we didn't see anyone out in the water like we went to this this point break that was amazing and um like it ended up being so good and like it was just me and the guy who took us there out and it was like friggin pumping it was so good and it was the most beautiful spot too and these like guys came in on their fishing boat and they had the Cote d'Ivoire, like they'd obviously come from the neighbouring country, they're fishing and they were like singing and dancing on the boat, the sun's going down. It was so like such an amazing experience. There's just no one around, just me and, and Lachey who took me there. Um, and yeah, I found that everyone was just very um, like, just pretty stoked to show us, show, show us the coast basically. Yeah, amazing. Oh, that's so interesting. And what about the ladies in the in the surf scene there, the young girls that were in the film? Tell us a bit about them. Yeah, so they're like age 13 to 16. Um, there's I think there's actually eight girls who do surf, but there's just four four girls who we who have sort of featured in the film who we spent the most time with. And um the first couple of days I felt like they were pretty shy just a little I, I think also they had in um just as said that all of the kind of like traveling pros that have come to the area have all been men so they haven't until recently they haven't really met any female like good surfers I guess and so at the start it was a little bit like a bit standoffish and then they like really warmed to us or to me and then we did it was just so fun like they're so silly and just being out in the lineup, like I wish I could have had a mic out there recording what they're saying. Like they're just shadow shadowing behind me, like Lucy, Lucy, how do we duck down? Lucy, Lucy, is there sharks in Australia? <laughs> Lucy, Lucy, have you seen a dolphin? <laughs> it was really, it was just really playful, which was um, yeah, that was it was really cool. And um I think, yeah, like they're just kind of the very first girl surfers you know so hopefully like what they're aiming to do now through the Obabini Girl Surf Club which is what they're part of is to um like raise the funds to train the first female um Ghanaian surf instructors so to actually like help them get their coaching qualifications so that they can actually have it as like a career path and go into working in that so um yeah it's pretty cool having like knowing that they hopefully there'll be some of the girls that are able to stick with it as they get older and um and kind of go into like a sort of surf related career as the first girls in Ghana to be doing it one of the sickest things about this film is just the the innocence and the, the playfulness that's attached to surfing in that part of the world in Ghana you know it's got none of the seriousness and obsession with performance and style and, and all that stuff so you get to see surfing in its purest form and how uh, that's really what it's meant to be like it's meant to be about just feeling the energy of waves whether you're going dead straight or trimming a little bit like um as the young girls were doing like it's kind of irrelevant what's relevant is how much happiness they're getting out of it and man they're getting way more happiness out of it <laughs> than a lot of the guys i see up here tearing the bag out of it on one of the many point breaks 
Yeah, totally. It was so funny. Like they would sort of finished school and it's like 3 p.m. or whatever. Like the onshore's in hard. It's like pretty low tide and no one even checks the surf. No one's like, oh, it's not looking good. Might not go out. It's just like grab your board out there. <laughs> doesn't even matter what it's like. And um, yeah, I feel like that, like that's so true that it, it's just about, I think when you don't, also when you don't have this kind of like, you know, you're not tapped into this whole industry and you're not on your friggin' social media all the time. You're not like locked into this path of like, or like this vision of what a perception of what surfing means and how you have to keep up your place in it through like your performance level. Like you literally just surfing because it feels really good. And it's a chance for you to hang out with your friends after school, which um, yeah, it was a really nice um opportunity to revisit that feeling I think which is probably more of what I felt like when I was a kid <laughs> mm. yeah and documenting these kind of remote or burgeoning female surf populations it's been a bit of a, a life's work for you like tell us about some of the other places that you've visited around the world or, um, where these kind of communities exist yeah so it's like it's not something that I have just consciously decided to do, but it seems to have just ended up that way that I've um, seemed to just go on these tours around <laughs> to, to meet female surf communities. Um, I think it's also, it's a two-way thing in that people that like, they know what I'm about. So then they invite me on these trips because they think it will be, um, you know, it would suit me or whatever. So yeah, I think, the first kind of pretty hardcore one, I not hardcore, but the first committed one I really trip I did was to Bangladesh in 2018. And um I was going there with actually a, an organization called um Make Life Skate Life. Maybe it's Skate Life, Make Life, I don't know. Um, and they were looking at building a skate park in Bangladesh because there's like a little surf and skate community there in Cox's Bazaar. So I went there with a friend to go and like just meet up with the community and see if we could get the land and stuff. And it was a project that didn't end up going ahead. But um, there was a, like a little girls surf club in Bangladesh. And um, that was, I mean, Bangladesh was pretty hard. I was pretty glad to leave in the end. The food was yummy and the girls were fun to hang out with. The kids were all really fun to hang out with. Um, and again, it was sort of a like, I hadn't really met any girl foreign girl surfers before so um it was quite a fun um experience to to surf and and do that with them talk to us a bit about bangladesh uh from what i've seen of of dakar the capital it's a pretty gnarly place like uh suffocating poverty i mean it's the world's factory basically uh you know so much of the world's garments are made there often for slave labor wages then you've got some really hardline Islamic influence. I remember some really horrendous ISIS attacks there. Um, I can't remember when that was exactly, but yeah, one of the worst I kind of saw them commit uh, happened in Bangladesh. I think a really big thing that happened uh, uh, probably probably 10 years ago now was when that factory collapsed, that big building collapsed and it was full of female garment workers and like hundreds of people died. But I think, like, in terms of of Bangladesh, it was hard, but actually the coolest part of it was Dakar because it's actually a pretty interesting place. And when I was there was when, I don't know if you followed this in the news, but there was, like, this big kind of student uprising going on um, where this kid had died in a bus crash. And so then there was, like, all these protests and students were stopping traffic and checking people's licenses and that just like the traffic is just like so intense there it's so dense and so them stopping traffic and checking people's licenses like really created this like you know a bottleneck kind of jam and um so there was all kind of conflict between the police and these students and there was like government official people who were employed allegedly by the government to go on and like 
to carry out violent acts on these students to try and disband them. And it was all pretty like, <laughs> there was like a bit of political unrest going on. And I was just there with my longboard. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, but the food was so good. And also you could like, yeah, I think it's, I think it's quite common in, in a lot of places where like, you know, it is, a it's like 99% Muslim there and it's quite conservative, but the city can often be the most open progressive place in that context. And it's more when you go to the more regional areas. And I did actually find it really hard, like wearing, you know, like long clothes and long and just in the heat it was really suffocating. And then we were staying with a family when we were down in the coast. And one um, one day I went to go downstairs to get something and I forgot that I have to like cover my entire body and I just ran downstairs with shorts on and I walked into the room and everyone looked at me like I was completely naked. And I was like, oh, my God, I've never been so embarrassed about my knees. But <laughs> <laughs> wow. And um, so I think I feel like life could be pretty tough there as a girl. But I think that there's a few, there's some women who, I mean, they're just resisting and they're pushing and they're they're, they're, they're making change in their own little ways um, under pretty challenging circumstances. Mm. Um, but it was a, I was, by the end, I was like, I'm, I need to get out of this place. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a pretty <laughs> oppressive atmosphere uh, for a woman who's, you know, from a liberated part of the world and is used to having freedoms of all descriptions. Mm. Um, yeah, and then I, a couple of years ago, I went to um, Algeria to meet up with Algeria's only female surfer. There might be a few more now, but um, that was very cool as well. And that was for a show called Brewing Corners. Um, and yeah, completely different again. Own, its own set of challenges, I guess. Um, but surfing on the Met, that was the first time I'd surfed the Mediterranean. And um, it was a lot better than I thought it would be. And I couldn't take my log because Emirates wouldn't let it on the flight. Mm, dogs. <laughs> What about Algeria? Like, talk us through, um, yeah, just getting off the plane there. I don't even know what the capital is, uh, but, I mean, paint the scene for us. Like, just walk along the streets of Algeria. Yeah, so the capital is called Algiers. Um, it's a former, former French colony, and um, they had a long, a long liberation. They had, they've had a lot of war in Algeria, and it's really I find it really interesting because they have this real, like, the Liberation War, there were women on the front lines, like the um, all the spies and the people that were planting bombs and stuff were were women, and they were the ones that were tasked with carrying out the task that you um, you need to be able to move in domestic spaces um, unnoticed. So that was quite cool, like, and they have this very like kind of glorified mythology of um of like the fallen female soldiers and and even going back like before the French were there when the Arabs invaded because there's an indigenous people like the indigenous Berber people that the the person who was said to like lead the resistance against Arab occupation was Queen Diha and so she's like no the the icon of um of the women led resistance woman -led, led resistance and the surfer that we went to meet up with her name is actually Diha and she's a vet and a triathlete and um and a surfer and um yeah like getting in stepping into Algeria was like stepping into maybe if imagine uh maybe if Perth had that same kind of history like geographically dry flat on the coast but then with these like huge like very well beautifully maintained French colonial buildings um and yeah we we so we were on the coast for a week or so and it was pretty dusty pretty isolated the water was amazing and blue and the beaches are just like beautiful but you kind of could imagine that you are like on the other side of the med in like Greece or something but without any of the kind of infrastructure on the shoreline so these just like a couple of kind of flat roofed houses and some gardens and like, a, I don't know, some horses and that kind of kind of thing. And none of the kind of like tourist activities or 
um, not really a lot of bars around. And then we drove into the desert into um, like, it's the sort of the gateway to the Sahara. And we went to this city where there's no forests, there's no wood around. So the entire city is built out of the desert. So <laughs> it's just like these valleys of buildings that are just like desert colored flat roof buildings. And um, again, it was, yeah, it was, that was a pretty strange experience there because it was, it's very, very conservative. And we had to, um, to get there, it was like a six hour drive. So we started driving at four o'clock in the morning and um, we were in like this old Mercedes van with Dika's husband and then a couple of the guys that I was traveling with. And we start driving and then we get stopped by the police and they're like, oh, you need to have a police escort because there's like risk of terrorist threats in the desert because some of the, the conflict from Libya spills over the borders. And um, so then they're like, okay, you have to wait here because you need to have the right police to take you across this municipality. And then when you get to the end of that one, you'll be met with the next police for the next one. So we were on the side of the road for like four hours, middle of nowhere, just like playing backgammon in the back of the van, <laughs> waiting, waiting. And then you get it, the, then the police finally come and they're driving like 130 k's an hour. And then we get a flat tire. And then we can't, no one knows how to change the tire. There's like truckies rocking up. Then the cops get a flat tire. Then we get a speeding fine. <laughs> <laughs> And we just like it was the most, it was so you just have we just had we're being so silly because it was the only way to really deal with the um the long periods of sitting around and not really knowing what was going to happen but it was a really cool trip but I also feel like I I don't know if I would go back if it wasn't on like a, a trip like that which was to like film an episode of a show mm. um without a crew and that kind of thing and also like going through the desert because they've got oil there. And you can just like see the um like the the refineries or whatever they are, just like these flames burning in the distance. <laughs> it was pretty, it was pretty, yeah, interest, interesting visuals for sure. Mm, wow. Sounds like a really intense and pretty inhospitable place, especially for a woman, a white woman. I mean, what's your take? on you know countries like bangladesh uh algeria i mean i guess even ghana to a degree being a western educated feminist um you know the, the level of oppression towards women in these cultures i mean what do you make of that yeah um i think i mean to get technical about it um like my background i did an undergrad in anthropology where is a very much taking an approach of cultural relativism. So um, you it's to, to, to be open and learn properly and experience in a true way when you go to these places, you need to just really be aware of your culturally ingrained bias and the, the values and just awareness of the, of the way that your my values, and my perceptions of equality and liberation are coming from through a like a Western liberal feminist framework. And I can't take that framework and put it onto somebody else's life and tell them and then judge them for that. So even though I might find it hard to live in places like that, I just always do my best to, to know that um, I can't know what someone else's experience is like living in that place because I am not from that place and I don't know what it's like to be that person. Um, so that's basically what I try and how I try and approach these all the time and to not, um, you know, to not be judgmental in these ways or in the ways that people are and to just like I'm there to learn, I'm not there to change anything. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what I do. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, far out. Oh, yeah, it is complex, as you said. Uh, it's just, yeah, kind of lost for words imagining uh, the experience of being a woman under lock and key like that and uh, being dictated to in a multitude of different ways. That is just so stifling. Um, and um, I guess it's, yeah, what they're used to 
but yeah, I mean, far out. I guess it it must shape your understanding of the place women hold in society here, seeing what women are up against there. Way, but it's it's not a way. It's not in a way that I go there and I see the situation that these women are in and think I'm just thankful for what I've got at home. It's not like that at all. It's more like I go there and I see what these women experience and I I can see what we're up against here at home too. Um, and and always bearing that in mind, you know. So I think like we have so much so far to go here in Australia too. Um, every day you have to be um you know, every day is a, is another day that you have to resist and be part of the struggle. <laughs> and even though for us, for a lot of women anyway, and especially for me um, as a white woman, able-bodied, um, it's I like the kind of dimensions of oppression that I say I experience are, are, minim, are minimal um, compared to some people. But I also feel like, there's there's just like the whole idea of cultural relativism, I guess, is that you just can't really compare two societies and measure whether one is better or not. Mm. So just try not to do that too much. Yeah. Did you have these kind of conversations at all with any of the women there? I mean, what was their take on the way they were kind of forced to live by these um, fairly oppressive patriarchal mm-hmm. systems? Yeah. Like I think, um, it's funny because like the women that I have met in say Bangladesh and Algeria and Ghana, they're surfers, you know? So in a lot of ways, like their struggles are different, but in a lot of ways there's a shared understanding of what it's like to go, okay, I'm just going to ignore all the things that society is telling me to do and just catch waves. You know, I'm going to accept the fact that I might be less physically attractive as a result of doing this. Or I might accept the fact that not everyone understands what I'm doing, what my choices are. I'm just going to accept that and not care and just go and do it. And that's what the girls in Ghana are doing. That's what the girls in Bangladesh are doing. And that's definitely what Dihar in Algeria is doing. And so I guess my data is a little bit um, skewed because I'm, <laughs> I wasn't out meeting all women in these places, just these particularly fierce um, women who are like committed to the shred, you know? <laughs> I love that. I mean, yeah, that's a really good cross section of women to be meeting in these places because I mean, who's going to be more committed to upending social norms than, than your yeah, humble waxhead who just wants to, Built a couple, a couple of backside and frontside wahas, and uh, you know, yeah, that 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 must be freaking radical for cultures like that that are used to women performing such, uh, you know, such domestic roles and, and and whatnot. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm like in, the girls in Ghana, like didn't really talk about this with the surfers because they're pretty young, um, like they're thirteen and stuff. But the skaters, um, there's a bit in the film actually where one of the skaters, Eden, where she says, um, you know, like there's side comments, people ask like, aren't you going to find a husband? And like, what do you mean you're a skateboarder? And she's she says, I don't care, bro. We're doing this for us. And um, I feel like that's just such an empowering thing to say. I was like, hell yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> and, cool. yeah and, and you know stranger to africa you've actually uh been traveling there for many years um beginning in your early 20s i mean yeah where did you land first and uh what was behind this decision yeah so basically it started when i was 21 and i was um i was living in Torquay and i was going to uni and my me and my housemate basically my housemate was like I want to quit uni and go to Africa. And I was like, okay, I'll come. So we did. We went um, first stop. It was going to originally going to be a four-month trip. And first stop, um, Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe. And we get on the 
plane. We we fly to Johannesburg and then um, get on this little plane into Zimbabwe. And on the plane was Stefan Hunt. Yeah, he's a filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah, surf <laughs> surf filmmaker. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. like a huge surf filmmaker at that time, but uh, it was so random. Like there was these like northern. He was in the northern beaches, and it was like this three northern beaches dudes on this tiny little flight to um, Victoria Falls. And um and then we had a week or something there and then like I just remember landing. I remember being so nervous before we went because all anyone says is like, oh my God, Africa's so dangerous. What are you doing? And just thinking, oh my gosh, are we gonna die? Like <laughs> what's gonna happen? And landing Victoria Falls, I just remember we get picked up by this the shuttle to go to our hostel and um like stop get stopped by the cops and the driver just like gives a note to the police and we were like corruption <laughs> <laughs> for the recording that was my jaw dropping <laughs> <laughs> and so when we go into into big falls and we um we go into the hostel and, and we're sitting there and then this baboon just runs into the living area opens the fridge grabs a bag of oranges and just runs off and again i was like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> but then within a few days we had like linked up with this local girl and she like took us to her house and showed us around in the township and we just like had absolutely no idea of where we were or what we were doing so we didn't have any kind of preconceptions of we should go there and we shouldn't go there that's dangerous that's done so we ended up meeting some really cool people caught a train down to South Africa and like some kind of hellish freaking long, long overland journey and landed in J Bay and spent the winter in J Bay. Joe went on a road trip up to Namibia. Like wait, 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 wait. Let's pause on the uh winter at J Bay. So what year was this? 2014. 2014, right. Yeah, talk us through J Bay at that point. I mean, I guess it at that stage, it's a pretty well-developed town. Like uh, I think I first went there in 09 and there wasn't yet a slum attached to it or a township as they euphemistically call it. But I imagine by 2014, uh, the, the town's grown quite significantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, how'd you go down there for waves and, and what was your experience at j -Bo? Yeah, at the time, I loved it. Since I've been back, my feelings about it have been a little bit different as I've gotten older, I think. But like we rocked in and we're like, oh my God, the most perfect waves I've ever seen. There's a longboard wave at the bottom of at like the bottom of the point. We just rented this flat and surfed every day in perfect waves for three months. And I guess at that stage, I didn't have a huge grasp of like of the kind of political economic situation in South Africa. Mm. And, and you don't get that being in J-Bay even today, really. It, it's definitely a fairly insulated place compared to, uh, say, Johannesburg in particular, Cape Town to a lesser degree, from what I understand. Yeah, I think also like the surf community, I think the surf community is changing. I think there are starting to be more black and coloured people in surfing in J-Bay, but I think that it's quite a separated community and that there's like the location as they call it which is like the township is at one end of town and the kind of all the white people basically live at a, another end of town down near the point I think it's a very Christian community again it's like very conservatively Christian in that way and found that a bit strange um but it was cool we met some cool crew there and then um yeah kind of did a lot of exploring in South Africa as well and spent some time in Cape Town and um, did some really big silly in Cape Town, which was fun, and um, took a Hyundai i10 through the Namibian desert, <laughs> past all the diamond mines and the wind and the flies and the all the, that stuff. And Straight and, past uh, Skeleton Bay, no doubt. Probably didn't know it existed yet. I think it was found in 2014. No, it was... We knew about Skeleton Bay, but I mean, I'm a regular footed longboard. I was not going near that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, wow. Wow. There's a lot uh, I'd love to dive into there. I, I'm 
just endlessly fascinated by other people's uh, surf travel experiences and um, just people and places in general from around the world. I mean, that's just what gives humanity its color and, and flavor. I'm so interested in it. Like, Talk to us about, I mean, you mentioned a road trip from J-Bay to where was that? Was that like the trans guy or that kind of stuff? Um, yeah. And then, so we we did that. We we went through, we, yeah, went to the trans guy, went to Cape Town, went to um, Namibia. And then we were going to go up, I think we were going to planning originally to drive to Mozambique. But then we ended up flying and um, went to this wonderful little village called Tofu which is now on the map for um, African Kira is there. And, um, yeah, got there. And we were supposed to keep on going north and fly out of Tanzania and go home. And we just got to Tofu and we didn't go any further. And we ended up staying there for the whole summer. I worked at a dive centre as a receptionist. And um, I'd never dived. People would come in and I'd be like, how's the viz? <laughs> <laughs> nice um i've dived i swear (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah and then at that time there was like the surf community in in mozambique was tiny there was like a few expats a few like basically like a couple of guys who would have been like in their 20s and 30s and then three brothers mini uni and junior who were teenagers or junior was like a a kid and then like a couple of other kids but that was like basically it and the waves are really fun there and it's like blue water and it's beautiful white sand and um and then yeah we spent a whole lot of time there had really amazing waves and since then um there was the Gardaskis brothers did a, one of their board drives and um, donated like hundreds of boards to Surfers Not Street Children, which is an organisation in Durban. And so Surfers Not Street Children decided to like start a, an arm in Mozambique. Completely different program because it's like a, it's it, it's a small village, so they don't have the kind of like street children thing really. Like most children have families, but it's more like an after school program type of thing. Um, And then they, so they've got like a, they started that. And then since then, the like local surf population has exploded. Mm. It was pretty cool when they started like these little kids who just like have never surfed before. They're riding these like sick, like twin fins and stuff that have been sent home from California. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. Um, And yeah, that was kind of what we did. I ended up coming home like seven months later, like credit card maxed out, like so we just partied a lot and um, came back and, and all the people that had said like, um, I just remember this moment that we were camping on this beach in Mozambique. There was like beautiful palm trees, these amazing like old Portuguese ruin, like ho- ruins of this old Portuguese hotel on the headland this like perfect right point, these blowholes, this little village. We had like bought fresh tuna off this woman, cooked it on the fire, sleeping in the tent and just sitting there going, so this is like all the war and disease and stuff in Africa, right? (laughs) Fully. Just realizing like, oh my God, all the stuff that we get told about what Africa is as one big entity is just so wrong (laughs) yeah well it's so it's so regional it completely depends where you are i mean south africa is one of the gnarliest joints on earth and uh you know just for the murder rates and the violence and uh, i mean that's fact um and and you guys were naive 21 year olds (laughs) ripping through there on a car trip like uh mozambique i understand is quite a bit safer i mean it doesn't have the same racial dichotomy that south africa has where you have 10 percent of the population being white and owning everything and then 90 percent being black and colored and living in uh, essentially dog kennels made from scavenged wood and tin with dirt floors and no electricity etc um so and then there maybe i understand it maybe is like fairly safe too right like um I think though, even like with South Africa though, 
it's like sure there is there are dangerous scenarios there and i also understand that it's very different to live there than it is to visit <clears throat> but even in you know even in johannesburg which is like the, the first time I went to Johannesburg, I was too scared to leave the bus station. But then getting to know Johannesburg over the years and realizing like even in Johannesburg, there are amazing people doing amazing things and there are cool places and there are fun places. Of and, course, yeah. Um, and I guess that is sort of... Just don't stop at the red lights at night. Because <laughs> you might get yeah. a fucking gun shoved in you. you I know, like you know. before I left, and people said that, like, whatever you do, don't stop at the red lights in South Africa. And just being like, how do you like go through an intersection and not die? <laughs> how do you not get hit? How do they coordinate the traffic if you don't stop at the red lights? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what <laughs> one thing I've noticed in terms of just a, a crude yardstick for whether a place is dangerous or not you ask people from there whether they uh have been in an armed hold up or, or know anyone who's been in an armed hold up and you cannot find a person from south africa or brazil for that matter who has who doesn't answer yes to both those questions or at least one of them yeah and i think though like from the years of being in these in places like South Africa and Mozambique and is kind of like what has informed why I have made we've made this Ghana film, why I wanted to make the Ghana film and why I wanted to make it the way that we have, in that that every country and every place has things that are not good about it. But the thing with so with African countries is that those stories about things not being good seem to be the only stories that people want to tell or the only mm. things that people want to talk about in regard to those places. Like in Australia, fucked shit is going on every single day. Like in my line of work, I deal with it day in and day out of like the, the like gross, broad human rights violations that happen in our prisons, like the mass abuse of so many marginalised people in New South Wales who turn to the government or the department that is supposed to assist them, who turns them away and doesn't care. And, yeah, we get films made about Australia. We get surf films out of Australia. We get all kinds of positive stuff coming out of Australia, as we should, because there are those great things that are happening. We don't have to put those stories of, of you know, deprivation, poverty and human rights violations in every story that we tell about Australia because... Our country and our, our our home has a complex identity, and there's co the stories are diverse that come out of it. And I feel like what so ha happens so often for the representation of African nations and African communities is that that story of it being dangerous or there being bad things happen happening has to be worked into every story that Western media tells every story that and, and it creates this idea that that's all that there is and I feel like that is so unfair to all the people that are doing amazing things and are just doing having fun and being silly and being creative and being innovative in 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 those places that we deny them the opportunity to have their stories um spotlighted so um I think that's kind of what I have learned from from spending time um, traveling in Africa, and you know, like even with Ghana, like as soon as I say like, oh, we made a film about Ghana, like literally have finished the film for like a week, <laughs> and the amount of people that I have said like, oh, do you want to have a screening? And they're like, should we have a fundraiser? Is this a charity? Should we do a board drive and try and get boards for people in Ghana? And and it's like. No, we're just making a film. <laughs> we just made it. It's just a film. It's not well, a charity operation. Wouldn't, wouldn't you ask them if that's what they want? Well, like, but it, it's not my, it's not my objective to come in and see their project and try and and help them because that's not my role. My role role is to is I want to tell a story. Mm. For sure, but like, yeah, I mean, look. I just, uh, as a journalist, I just, A, play what's in front of me. Like 
what I see is what you get. Like I'm just a conduit for the experiences and the people I talk to. Um, and South Africa caught me off guard, man. I wasn't ready for that. Like, uh, and I have no knowledge of Africa or Morocco, but beyond that, I, I couldn't tell you one thing about uh, any of those countries that's uh, going to be factual. It's it's just all part of the, the media simulation that I exist in and I understand that. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, I get it being a journalist. Yeah, that, that is your role. Uh, it's not necessarily to, uh, to uh, be a philanthropist. They're, they're, they're different roles. But at the yeah. same time, uh, I'm all for helping people just because uh, it's the human thing to do. Well, yeah, like I, I appreciate that, but I believe that the biggest change we should be making is in our own backyard, really, primarily. Oh, well, yeah. And the, yeah I mean, right. what like if, you wanna, if we want to do a board drive for this community in Ghana, then like, what are we doing to help people here too? Yeah, Cabbage Tree Island. If anyone's uh, got some money, the uh, Indigenous mission around the corner from me, it's uh, on an island and it completely went under during the floods and they actually had to condemn the whole island. So they're living on the golf course around the corner from me and I would love to get a bunch of boards. In fact, I was just chatting to Dane Gadiaskis about this. Mm. Uh, he was our very last guest, our last call lord. Or second last, something like that. But um, yeah, I mean, like you said, I would love to get a, a minivan and a stack of boards and uh, pick the kids up and take them to the beaches out the front of here, which are always uncrowded because they're fucking a thousand k's long. But um, <laughs> no, I back it. And, and not just Aboriginal kids. I mean, frick, like I, I tend to look at things uh, along lines, less of race and more of uh, trauma and class, which don't discriminate. So um, yeah, I'm just down for helping people from fucked circumstances into surfing because it's such a corrective experience. It really gives you so much purpose uh, and exposes you to a crazy world of travel and ideas and eccentric characters. And it's just so nourishing for a kid from a difficult circumstance. Totally. I back it. That sounds great. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> now where else in africa so madagascar yeah yeah went to madagascar um it would have been like 2015 2016 um and that was like all of the weirdest stuff i've ever seen i saw in madagascar <laughs> <laughs> And so Madagascar is an island off the east coast yeah, yeah. of Africa. And yeah. uh, what's the history there? So is it Madagascar that has like uh, people who are like ethnically Indonesian living on it somehow? Yeah. So it's, it's the fourth largest island in the world, I'm pretty sure. Like it's massive, but we just, it's one of those ones that people just seem to forget about. Um, and yeah, it's, off the, it's basically like look straight back into Mozambique. And it was, I think the history there is that it was not populated for a long time. I don't know. I couldn't tell you actually when it started to be populated, but they, I, I think it is that there was, um, people rowed across the Indian Ocean in canoes from Malaysia and wow. like the Andamans and that kind of region. Oh, interesting. And, um, and landed in Madagascar and they went to the central highlands. So the center of Madagascar is very hilly and at quite high altitude. And so that whole area, which is where the capital is, which is called Antananarivo, um, they, everybody there kind of looks like Malaysian. And there's all rice paddies and stuff. And I remember flying in, like you could see these like, hectic like mogul New Zealand-esque hills that have just been like sliced into um, rice paddies and while you kind of see that when you fly into Indonesia the difference is that the sand like the dirt is like bright red because it's like African soil and then but it was a French colony as well so you land there and there's like all these French colonial buildings cobbled streets and I think they they got independence in the 50s as well. And I think then since then, it's kind of like a little bit Cuba-esque in a way that not through geopolitics that have frozen it in time, but through geographical isolation. 
So all the cars, like you get a taxi, it's like this little beige mini, like 1950s. Got a taxi where we sat on deck chairs in, in the back. There was no chairs. They just put a deck chair out. And then they had a 1.25 litre um, bottle for with a tube coming out of it for fuel. And we're like, yeah, can we just put our boards in here? <laughs> Didn't have my long board. But um, it was so like the, um, and then it was just so like there's people, like, people pulling um like rickshaws like running pulling carts loaded up with like vegetables and food stuff and then like running along the cobbled streets next to like i don't know a mercedes that's like somebody from the world bank or whatever and there's all these like foreign people or like mining i think they have um some kind of mining there and and then there's just like people reading the newspaper, like women in um, big Panama hats and these kind of like very colourful markets. And of course, there's one hostel in the place being run by some Aussie dude from like Ballard or something. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Of course there is. <laughs> and then you go down to the coast, like we got in a bus and went down to the coast. It was like more than 24 hours in this bus. And um, I just remember going to sleep and then waking up and looking outside and I felt like I'd gone to sleep in Asia and woken up in Africa. It was just like flat, arid, like tundra. And I think we got two flat tyres or something. We ended up on the side of the road for like five hours just sharing like a little cracker in the hot sun with no water. no no phones no idea what the time was and just being like I think the sun was down when we stopped and now it's in the middle of the sky and then finally getting down to the coast and getting picked up by a guy like who rides the bike and you sit in the car in the back and um and just this like super dry uh like coastal city where it's like four dollars for a tuna steak and there's like big bowl babs and and then, yeah, we went and we surfed along the coast. We, like, met up with this Kiwi dude who does surf tours there and um, just stayed in huts and, like, the sand dunes and the 40-degree heat and surfed the most, like, clearest water I've ever seen. We were, It was sort of, like, summer, so it wasn't really good surf season. We still had fun waves, but I'd love to go back in winter when it's, like, a proper swell. And then coming back off the boat and, like, pull back into the harbour and um, there's no jetty just a cart pulled by two cows wading up to their chin comes out to the boat and you just get in the cart and they take you back to shore. (laughs) Holy smokes, dude. That is a wild adventure. And so just to draw a bit of a timeline, so uh, how did you get there? Like from where did you depart to get to Madagascar? So I was again, I was with my friend Anna, who we had done the previous trip to Africa with. And um, I came home for like not even a year, maybe a year. And then we went to Sri Lanka and then we were like, you know what, let's go to Madagascar. (laughs) Just across the Indian. So we flew into Johannesburg and then flew to Madar. And we were there for a couple of weeks and then went back to Mozambique after that. And I ended up staying there for like six or seven months or something. Wow. Wow. Um, oh, man. And, and did you get to see, I imagine you did many times, but what's that, uh, what does that point look like in Mozambique when it's absolutely off its head? African Kira? Mm. I never actually saw it properly working when the time that I was there. There is another point there that I surfed a lot that's more like snapper, not as long, but it's like a different kind of way, but it breaks behind a rock like that. But that... Um, the like the African Kira way. I think it's it's pretty elusive. I think it's been working a bit this summer, but it's kind of like the first time it's really worked in a long time. Mm. And sometimes you'll be lucky if it works in once once in a season, and it'll then maybe work for a day, and then it's done. And when I first started going to Mozambique, it wasn't crowded at all. But now I think the transport has gotten a little bit better. There's this connecting road, like in down sort of like in the city that you used to have to do this big like diversion around the capital city to come up from Durban but now you can kind of just like fly over 
when you drive. So it's not like three hours off the drive. So I think it's a lot easier the commute for the staffers from Durban to come up and um, and just like do a strike mission when they know there's going to be swell. So I think it's gotten a lot busier since then. Mm. Um, and but when did- I was there, it was, yeah, it was pretty pretty quiet <laughs> wild uh you must be the i'm gonna go out on a limb and say you're the most intrepid female surfer out there i, I i've never heard of one that's uh roughed it and and spent just the, the the duration in these places that are so hard to reach uh mozambique like you know give us a bit of a rundown of the the history and culture of the place and, and did you visit i mean you were there for six or seven months so I, I, what's the capital i assume you went there and yeah yeah it's um so like tofu in the village as i said it's like idyllic you know there's like fun parties every night there's like it's beautiful kind of it's a diving location there's a lot of people who travel there um but the rest of mozambique like the capital city again it's kind of like it can be dangerous um you have Kind of Mozambique has a lot of resources. They have gas in the north. So you do in the capital city, like there's a lot of people with money right alongside a lot of people who have nothing. Um, and that dynamic um, will always create friction and conflict. Um, but it's like the thing I've always found that I've loved about being in Mozambique is that everyone's so chill. <laughs> like it's a very it's like and I always I just feel like I learned so much about like having humor under pressure from being there because you can always find a way you know like you can always the answer is never no like you can always find a way to get something done you can always find a way to fit this massive surfboard into this tiny car or (laughs) you can always there's a way there's just a very um like an underlying level of positivity and humor that makes it a very, a really great environment to be in. Um, I think I the thing I never predicted before I went there was like, you know, you think of Mozambique as like a pretty poor, pretty um, like, you know, a quite undeveloped country and that kind of thing. And just like having no realization of how much like African people and Mozambican people love to party and how much they love music and like everyone's a freaking DJ, everyone's a rapper, like there's so much life, everybody wants to go out every night <laughs> and Maputo, the capital is like that and um, I think there's, there's, it's just a very, very lively place, there's a lot of energy and um, like these small towns along the coast that are just like, they're paradise, you know, they're like, you can wake up and look at the most beautiful view you have ever seen on the Indian Ocean. And there's whale sharks and the whale migration is the most insane thing. The humpback whales is like, I think because it bottlenecks like through the ocean gets quite narrow through the um, Mozambique channel with Madagascar on the other side. So it just kind of funnels all these whales right in close to the shore. And yeah, it's, it's amazing place to, to be and to travel. And, um, you know, again, it, it has its, its challenges. They have sort of a lot of ongoing conflict in the North around, I mean, it's resource conflict, which happens everywhere. Um, and so some, there are some people that are living in pretty challenging circumstances too. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, the way you describe those idyllic coastal towns, it sounds like almost as good as it gets in a sense, like, yeah, you don't have all the, the bells and whistles and, and trinkets of, you know, the Western capitalist consumer reality, but what you've got is fresh tuna um, mm. or like locally grown produce. Um, yeah. Some uh, fairly rudimentary housing I'd imagine, but like, you know, you don't really need a fucking six bedroom McMansion anyway. Um, so yeah, I imagine I- people are very fit and healthy and very connected to nature Mm. um which there's a lot to be said for that way of life not to um say that they're not up against uh, some serious pressure to uh, i imagine that the the uh amount of money like the wages and the amount of money people subsist on is super marginal yeah i think um i think that's like you've framed that in a really good way and that like there's a lot of people who live subsistently like there's people that I met there who are like, I don't have any money and I don't need any money. I don't have money. Um, it's because you grow what you need. 
but the problem but but that's not what everybody wants for themselves either you know some people what well, they want to go to university they want to travel and that is not necessarily available mm. as an option in the, yeah they want tech the neck system. they want uh you know they want to be staring at a computer screen they want like shiny western horse shit that adds no joy or happiness to your life mm. as far as i can tell because i've and I mean, fucking had it all it, Lucy. It. if you want it you can get it it's definitely in a market there <laughs> not the real version our version <laughs> yeah a version uh so you get a little taste yeah it, it's funny isn't it it's uh i guess the grass is always greener mm, yeah. that, that's really what it is and they have a really interesting history too like they were a portuguese colony and Oh, it was like a long colonial occupation. It was like 500 years or something. And um, and then when when the Portuguese left, it was like 19, I think it was 1972, that the Portuguese basically, they had all these colonies like Angola and Mozambique and Sao Tome, Principe, and like a bunch of, of colonies that then they, when they decided to um, to leave their colonies, they did it in like a week and they left all of them and they just they just left. There was no succession plan. They were just gone. Hmm. And so then in Mozambique, as there was in Angola as well, there was a um, a, a struggle for, for power then. There was a power vacuum that happened. It was basically a, a north versus south kind of division um, that was eventually won by Frilimo who brought in it was a Marxist communist movement that they brought in and so it was a um Mozambique was like a Cuban ally at, in the 70s and hmm. 80s I actually don't know when they um changed their system but there are people there who um would be in their 40s who remember when they they had food tokens instead of money like they would go and collect their their rations or whatever I imagine that that probably collapsed around the time that Soviet Union Soviet Union collapsed too. I'm not sure. Um, and then they've never they have democratic elections, but they've never had a change of government. So the wow. um the the opposition party is like I guess they're like a it's basically yeah like the city party is is who's in government now. It's really more. And then there's um oh I think it's called Renamo Renamo it would be they they are in the north and they have all the resources. So there's almost like a bit of a separatist movement. Um, and that's where a lot of the conflict can happen. Um, but yeah, it's uh, um it's you can you can tell how that that history has has also informed has shaped a lot of people there, um, having lived through um violence. Um, and it was a long war too. Mm. Now you're showing up in these places um, with a 10 foot longboard. So like, you know, how are people taking this when you've got your Mozambican or uh Namibian taxi driver with his like hatchback and you're there uh, yeah, carrying this huge chunk of fiberglass. I mean, what's the worst someone's taking it? Yeah. So the funny thing is the hardest place to travel with, boards is actually like the uk and europe and stuff because mm. there's all these rules about what you can do and like when i've been on these really big trips like that year in 2016 i was away for almost 12 months and i just had a 5920 with me i didn't have a long board with me because it was just completely okay. impractical. but that there is some logistical tra- challenges that you always have to i feel like traveling with a long board you always have to be like um, you, you have to do all this planning that you wouldn't have to do if you didn't have it with you. Like you can't just be somewhere. You need to know what you're going to do with your board while you're there. If you're fly, if you're not flying out for six hours, you can't just like go into the city because what are you going to do with your your board? Or I always like if I've got my longboard, I always bring soft racks or straps or whatever. And I feel like generally everywhere I go, people are um pretty good with just like chucking a board on the roof in Ghana we like had my long boards because my boards didn't arrive for five days they were still in um Sydney for that whole time thank you Pontus and so when I finally went to get them like it was like a seven hour drive we just tied them on the roof of this car of a taxi and the cops 
like it was actually pretty funny. <laughs> so when the boards arrived, the airport called me and were like, you have to come to get them because um, they've been quarantined, like um, whatever it is, the cus customs won't release them. So you need to come and get them. And I had to, so I had to fly. It was like a 40 minute flight. And I get there and um, the guy, first of all, he's like, oh, that surfboard is locked in a office and the office is closed, so you have to come back tomorrow. And I was like, I'm not leaving until we get it out. So we went and got it. And then he was trying, he wanted me to pay an import tax. And I was like, oh, I'm not importing them. Like, I'm just using them. And I was like, look, it says for Lucy on the board and stuff. And so the, finally I had to Google myself and be like, see this picture of me on Google and me, that board that I'm surfing is this surfboard. <laughs> no way. Amazing. <laughs> and when I showed it to him, like there was an ABC story that said like champion surfer. And he was like, oh, you're a champion. And <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm a champion. Give me my board. And by the end of it, he's like, so can you teach me to surf? And um, I was like, give me my freaking boards. And then. Um, oh, you should have said, um, yeah, for a bit of buck sheesh. Come on, mate, cough up. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going back to the coast and it's like um like just had it tied straight on the roof and got pulled up by the cops like so many times that they're like you're not allowed to tie it on you have to have a roof rack oh because they're and all looking for their bit of bakshish <laughs> and there's one cop pulled us over and he was like pretty it was pretty intense he was like god you've got to take it off you've got to take it off and i was like and he's like would you do this in your country and i was like yes definitely yes this is how i would do it in my country and he was like i don't know he was just i think he was feeling like i was just deliver. i was just this white girl deliberately not obeying the rules so then again i had to whip out the champion thing <laughs> <laughs> well played i'm a champ i'm actually a champion and um <laughs> So then, I don't know, we had to give them some money or something. But, um, like, yeah, usually it's not an issue. Usually it's fine. And, like, there's been times that I've just had to, like, shove it down the, the aisle of a bus. And then you're sitting on a bus in Mozambique and you're like, oh, I've got my board down the aisle, it's blocking all the seats. And then someone just hops in and they, like, hand you the their baby to hold and then they sit down and got the chook on there with them or, like, there's a goat on the roof or something. <laughs> and you're, you're like, like, oh, yeah, this is pretty par for the course. <laughs> 10 foot surfboard <laughs> that's so good i love that oh man and like where did this journey begin for you i understand you you're from the the deep southwest uh kind of jody cooper country roughly yeah so um i grew up in the wonderful town of denmark which is um it's population five thousand five hours south of perth um pretty idyllic place you're up very quiet and my, um, I mean, the surf culture around there is basically like, it's like slabs, you know. The only person I've ever known to have a um, a magazine cover was, um, oh, my God, what's his name? He was on the cover at the right, on the cover of Surfing World. Um, um, Kyle Grigson. Or Kyle Chris Grigson, yeah. yeah. They're like local, local hero, Kyle Grigson. Um, like I remember when the right was like getting it was like when it was still secret. <laughs> it was like a couple of videos being passed around at school and stuff. Wow. And then um Grigi got the cover of Surfing World and it kind of blew up and like that was the kind of that's the kind of surf culture around there. So um I didn't longboard the right. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. I would have liked to have seen it though. What yeah, are... I mean, my home break was um Ocean Beach, which is um it's trying to be a right point, but it's mostly just like a straight hander beachy. <laughs> right. And so from there, you launched uh, a competitive longboarding career, more or less, or what's the chronology there? Yeah, so um, basically, like the West Australian um, longboard state titles used to have an event in Denmark. So um, there was like a few people who longboarded, and um, one year it came, and I saw them. I remember they were like, it was like 
a dark punk song playing and it was like this perfect peak and everyone's competing. I was like, I want to do that. So I went, I entered the next event, which was at Yelling Up Main Break. And the thing that I love about surfing WA still now, but at that time as well, was like, oh, the junior girls, like longboarding state titles, it's eight foot main break. Get out there, girls. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty, uh, that's West Oz for you. Holy smokes. Joint gets yeah, battered. I, and I had, I remember rocking up to yelling up and I had literally, I'd never served anywhere other than Denmark before. And I had, or actually, yeah, I, I had just never seen a really good wave before, basically. I just remember seeing it early in the morning. I think I was 16 and just getting there and just going, oh my God it's a perfect wave and I've actually never seen one in real life. <laughs> and um, so I just started doing like the surfing WA comps. And then when I was 18, my mum was basically like, you've got to get out of here. Like you can't just stay here. I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself. Everyone else was moving to Perth to go to uni. I didn't want to go and live somewhere that were, that were, there weren't any good waves. So I um, got a one-way ticket to the East Coast and went to Coolangatta which was great. And, um, yeah, just learned about how to be in a really busy lineup, <laughs> how to catch waves. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of have based myself on the East Coast pretty well ever since then in various locations. But um, at some stage I woke up in the morning in, um, I think I was on, is it Boundary Street, Boundary Road in Coolangatta? Not sure. That um I had a flat that I rented off from um, Nathan Hedges' dad, and um and I was like I'm getting so dumb I need to go to uni. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll do that to you. So I, I looked at a map of Australia and was like, where is there a university and sir? And so I went to Deakin University, Geelong, and moved to talking. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, and you've racked up a fair uh, amount of degrees or at least uh, areas that you've studied, um, anthropology, gender studies, uh, security and peace and conflict studies. Uh, you've written a master's uh, on the front lines of the Eritrean Liberation War. Uh, I mean, I guess so... You're studying and then in between your studies, you're traveling to Africa and, and elsewhere. You've also been to uh, Israel and Palestine, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So actually I ended up doing like the last year of my degree online while I was traveling. So I did like while I was in Mozambique and while I was in Israel, Palestine, and while I was in a bus zipping across Egypt and that type of thing, I was doing uni um, during my last year. I did a double major of <clears throat> anthropology and journalism because I thought I wanted to work for Nat Geo, and that's what I thought would help me. <laughs> um, and so, no, that, basically... that, that doesn't help you. What helps you is if uh, your dad was a famous journalist or you know someone who works for Nat Geo. Yeah, well, now I know that. When I was choosing my uni degree, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I basically it's like I guess I'm just I, – I just – I started studying and I didn't like it. Then I took a big break and then I started again and I just really love the learning element of it. My hex debt's huge. Um, and then, yeah, I, I – finished that and then I did my honours and I did the same thing I went back to Mozambique a couple of years later and spent like a whole year there doing my honours dissertation which I wrote about home <laughs> what home means and finding new home on the internet funnily enough and then um and then I finished that and I was fucking around I don't know what I was doing I was doing stuff and then, oh, I think I went and lived back in the um in the caravan park at um Denmark for eight months or something, and, <laughs> and then um and then I decided to do my masters and move to Sydney. So that's what I did, and that was in twenty nineteen, um, which has been my 
my part here. And I did that in person. I went to uni. I went there. But then it was the COVID pandemic. So then I actually was, I had to be remote anyway. But I was still in the country. I lived in Newtown in the inner west, which was great. And, um, yeah, that was Peace and Conflict Studies, which was awesome. And um, it was like, it was a zone that I felt like I, um, it combined a lot of my interests. Um, and I wrote my dissertation about, yeah, women's, my dissertate, my master's dissertation was called The Collective Joy of War. And it was about women finding joyful moments and, and joyful spaces on the front lines when they were not subject to, um, gender uh, inequality and the kind of asymmetrical gender power relations that might normally exist in their society that um, kind of fall away under crisis, such as in the front lines. So, um, yeah, that was what I wrote about. I took a theory of um, of festivals and um, and like yeah, the, a, a theory that that explains the kind of temporary temporal um, collective joy we experience in a like a joyful setting and applied it to um, the terrible and dire circumstances of the Eritrean Liber liberation war. Mm, wow. Yeah. Hold on to my baking apron. I'm going to get shredded by a machine gun nest and live my dream. <laughs> Is that the gist of it or? No, it was more like, so Eritrea is a very small country um, on the Horn of Africa that um, was occupied by the by Ethiopia. And then at the time, Ethiopia had like the biggest military in Africa. They were supported by, they were first supported by the US and then they were supported by Russia. And um, and they did without Eritrea, they have no access to a port. So Eritrea has they have got a Red Sea coastline. So they basically, and Eritrea wanted their independence. So they waged war against this, like it was a, it was like a David and Goliath kind of battle. And after thirty years, Eritrea pushed Ethiopia out and got their independence. But the population of Eritrea is like, at that time, it was like five hundred thousand or something. It was really, really small. And so they needed everyone to be part of the war effort. You couldn't have you know, sending the men to the front lines because there was literally just not enough. So they they just absorbed everyone into the war effort and um and including all the women. And you could also couldn't just have women in domestic roles on the front lines. They had to be soldiers and then they were generals and then they were like in these leader like these experiencing this kind of emancipation that they actually had never experienced before at home. And um and that the 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 movement the the liberation movement was a marxist feminist movement so they preached they like had this whole slogan about um that it, it was like no freedom without women's freedom or something it was like part of their their slogan for the movement and so they had all these like education programs this whole gender equality thing but then the war finished and what is happened so often in these circumstances is that the person who pushed and led that like with this amazing ethos and this ma amazing ideology that then they get the power that they wanted and then they don't, won't let it go. And Eritrea has had the same um, very oppressive um, dictator since 1993. And um, the supplies run short when you run a country like that. And um, as soon as the supplies are scarce, that's when you like all of the gains that women make are um, are lost. And so women were kind of forced back into the domestic space. And I think it was pretty hard for a lot of Eritrean women who would experience this like this unprecedented kind of freedom and liberty and power in the front lines and then having to go back and being like, just got to wash the dishes now and stay inside the house. <laughs> It's crazy. It, it, yeah, it really made me think about just this whole concept of, you know, you earn your stripes as a culture, a, a class, a gender by going to war. And uh, like, I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, but it kind of seems to be the way of the world to some degree. And, you know, when you come back from war, it's like, you're always got heavy trauma. Like, uh, you know, you've seen people die. You've uh, maybe killed people. 
And so like forcing those people back into a subservient domestic role would seem impossible. Once you've held a gun and, and mm. shot at people and you have those skills, you wouldn't think it'd be possible to then, you know, uh, jam them back into the box. Yeah, I think it's um it's sort of what like that that trend is not isolated to Eritrea. Like there's a lot of different um sort of wars and that have happened where women have experienced this temporary status elevation on the front lines and then as soon as the war's finished, um they're forced to go back into um into the domestic space. And a lot of it comes from um actually from capitalism, like in Eritrea, they reported that the biggest changes that happened following the war was when they they moved away, when the government moved away from, from a communist ideology towards a capitalist ideology. And in that world, the means of production come from largely from men working in paid work. And so that like the 40 hour work week or whatever it is, is hinged on the domestic labor of women because you can't have a family unless somebody is at home looking after the children and so a lot of it was through that that um that it's like it's not necessarily yeah like the I like I did my dissertation basically through from like combing through all of these like obscure YouTube videos and like random documentaries and also like a lot of research and first-hand interviews that other researchers had done with women who say like they even noticed they would be on the front lines with their fighting with their husband as equals. And then they'll go on holiday and the husband would be expecting them to um, like start doing the dishes and stuff and start doing mm. the domestic labor. And then you go back to the front lines and it's all shared labor. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting. I mean, yeah, it's one of the paradoxes of feminism, I guess it's like, you know, it's, it's, allowed women to join the workforce and it's allowed women to have uh, a level of finance financial emancipation but it turns out being working class fucking sucks like it has for hundreds of years and uh for a lot of women it's just turned into them joining this uh, oppressed class of people and uh in the countries like australia um you know this by some magic it's like as soon as women join the workforce and uh, the cost of living starts to go up and the price of housing and all these, it's, it's almost like, um, yeah, that, that financial leverage, that financial emancipation that um, women were striving so hard for for so long. I, I don't know what it's really eventuated to. Everything's still magically out of reach, it seems, for working class mm -hmm. people, male or female. Yeah, I think also like it's not just necessarily a matter of women joining the workforce and then joining the working class because they're doing domestic labor. So it's unpaid before that. So they were always in the working class and they were probably more oppressed with the limitations of not having, um, I mean, it all it's all hard, <laughs> no matter which place you're in. Um, but I think there are a lot of women who, um, I mean, the experience of class is different depending on your gender and your race and your um, your able body status, I guess. Um, and yeah, I think, I mean, I, I feel like that's a fair point. It is hard being working class no matter who you are. It's harder for some people. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I guess uh, I think it was Jermaine Greer who said, I'm a socialist first and I'm a feminist second. And uh Angela Davis is another one of my favorite feminists, you know, a black Panther who did time in prison. Um, and, you know, she completely understood class struggle as being at the the center of the, mm -hmm. the, the black Panther movement and the, you know, class solidarity, uh, class struggle, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, as being just fundamental, like coming together as a class um, mm -hmm. was, was really where all the power was. And then like, that's classic, like that's the old school left. Like that's the, the socialist trade unionist, uh, workers rights, workers collectives, workers unions left. And then I guess something changed. Something went a bit awry there, in my opinion, I guess uh, identity politics and um, that kind of new left uh, has come to dominate uh, the headlines and, and seems to 
the the new left is what seems to be known as left wing politics now. It's it's not about class. It's not about trade unions. It's not about class solidarity or class struggle. It, it seems like um the old left has been shattered into a a million competing tiny victim um pixels or a mosaic of uh, competing victim groups as opposed to just um yeah kind of i feel like the the solidarity of old school left-wing politics has been compromised by um identity politics but you're from a different generation to me i think and uh i mean going through gender studies and um, going through university at a time when it all became about identity politics. Like, uh, yeah, well, what's your take on all that? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the conversation around class is, um, it's it's been forced to move on from some, from talking about working class because in this country, class and race lines are um, suspiciously aligned. Um, and so it's not so much a conversation about identity politics, but it's about if we're going to achieve, like the the class solidarity is, is something that I guess it's more difficult to, to kind of comprehend if we're going to have, you know, like racism within the working class, like race struck, race, ra not racism as in overt racism, but as like racism as a structure, a power structure within and across classes. So it's more about, I don't know, I, I don't really know, feel like I'm well-versed enough in this to really talk about it fully in a podcast. Um, I think that like, yeah, I mean, intersectional feminism is basically what my politics are, which is about um, recognising that um, you can't just fight for women's rights because the because the rights of white women are so in such a different place to the, the rights of black women and women of colour in this country. And, so, and upper class versus working class. I think that's often the forgotten aspect of that um, brand of politics. Yeah, I think so. But I think even then there's going to be, there's a racial hierarchy in, in any conversation that, about that too. Like we, um, like the experience of a working class white woman is very different to the experience of a working class black or Aboriginal woman. Um, and the experience of a, of an upper class, of a upper class Aboriginal woman is going to be very different to that of a working class woman, white, white woman, sorry. Mm. Um so I think it's difficult to to lay those clear lines of class because the struggle is different. What you, and so like in Australia, you can't fight for women's rights without fighting for First Nations rights because if you don't work on um, First Nations justice, then what about the First Nations women? Because they belong to that, to to as you would say the the identity the identity the first nations identity um so you basically like i guess that is it it is a struggle of a different kind um and to know that in any struggle as as i am to be very conscious of the fact that my experience is immensely privileged relatively mm. yeah it's no fascinating class, i think yeah uh yeah it's uh yeah it, it just yeah to me it doesn't seem like the world has changed all that much like the same issues are still the same issues it's massive financial inequality um and the people who suffer are uh, the working class and no matter what your color like it, the inequality is it, it, it's still the same problem it's been for like 500 years the only there's just been a sleight of hand that's happened recently. And man, my theory is seriously that like identity politics, the first we ever heard about it was uh, when corporations started championing it as, as an idea because it enabled them to look uh, up with the times and progressive, despite the fact that, you know, structurally they were every bit as crooked um, as ever, you know, corporations are not champions of social justice and equality mm -hmm. uh but by 
pushing that narrative over and over again and uh you know through the media and, and advertising streams and the influence that they wield over the media uh we came to be at this juncture in history where um class struggles just seems to have been completely forgotten and uh, it fully baffles me but I, i'm not surprised like i, I actually think that <laughs> my wacky conspiracy theory is that uh identity politics is just cia psyops just yet another scheme by the cia to destroy the credibility of the left wing as they've been trying to do for i don't know since the end of the second world war and that the american universities that have been peddling this uh brand of politics are compromised imperial colonial institutions and they have fully gutted any opposition to uh inequality and and wealth distribution and and workers uh the oppression of workers okay <laughs> i don't really know what to say i mean <laughs> <laughs> i think that i feel like we cannot we cannot argue though that the experience of a poor of a poor working class white person is the same as a poor working class Aboriginal person. Well, if they're living side by side in the housing commission and they're going and doing the same job, like it's pretty similar. No, because you don't experience racial discrimination. As a white, as a white working class man, you don't face the risk of being shot and or sent to prison or killed in prison to any ex, to any of the same extent you would if you're an Aboriginal man. Like you yeah, don't. But this, this isn't the poverty Olympics, like. We're just trying to. But it's, not trying poverty, to... but it's not poverty Olympics. It's it's going. I feel like it's not. It's it's not possible to just go. Well, you are poor, so your experience is the same. Structurally, it's pretty similar. It's it's it like I guess like the the Black Panthers got it the best. They're like the, they wrote the manual for this shit. Like Fred Hampton, Angela Davis. Uh, Malcolm X and the reason these people were persecuted and shot dead and locked up was because that they were threatening to bring together white poor white and poor black people because they understood that the, the, they're up against the same problem the same force um, and, and that was that's old school left-wing politics trade unions like if you're in a trade union like you're a factory worker or working on the wharves or whatever and it, where I'm from in the eastern suburbs South Sydney like it's very multicultural, the working class. And you get to understand that, wow, like things are so similar across the races um, in terms of like financial opportunity and um, how it shapes your experience of the material capitalist reality and culture. But but I just feel like, sure, I don't want to, I don't discredit your experience. And I'm sure that is what ha- what it was like, but I don't think that you can speak for the experience of First Nations people in New South Wales and know what it's like to be a poor Aboriginal person here because you grew up. Yeah, I mean, you're using a specific example, like Indigenous people have um, so much trauma, like, and it's fresh. And it, it, like, really, I think that that is the the what's at the bedrock of so much of the problems in the indigenous community is just the most insane radioactive nuclear levels of trauma and and the the recent history of all that um so but it's also the ongoing systemic oppression of people and the ongoing structural violence direct physical and structural violence of a system that just bears down on people and and that is specific to first nations people. like yeah i mean i've known aboriginal people who are very successful in the working class you know ex-girlfriends of mine i uh, was the the daughter of a very famous aboriginal actor i won't say his name but he's from cape york and you know i've seen people function immensely well um in the working class being indigenous they weren't necessarily from housing commission backgrounds although one was um so it, it it really is, yeah, and, and and they were given work, welcomed into the workforce, not discriminated against. So it, it's all like, yeah, like it, it's. But I feel like you actually don't know what their experience was. Well, you can't know. I mean, yeah, nor can you, nor, nor can anyone. It's all an assumption. Yeah. And I guess I'm basing my assumptions on just conversations I've had with these people. And I'm not denying that. 
Um, yeah, if you're going up in a on a mission or in a housing commission area and like subject to over policing and the high incarceration rates and then the insane intergenerational trauma on top of that, which I which is really what I think is the main catalyst for so much of the the pain and so, incarceration. So that, if you if you think that that experience is then what um, defines the way that many Aboriginal people um, experience the world in which we are in, then why is it that you think that it's bad we should particularise these experiences if you do identify that there is a difference? The difference is in trauma, though. So it, it's about how to how do we treat trauma, and that's hard. But I mean, all the science seems to be around MDMA and psilocybin at the moment. It's around like Wim Hof breath work, ice baths. But like if you're in if you're in Coonabarabran Kuna, and there's no services for that, or no one that will pay attention or validate or listen to you, there's no one that will support you to do that. Then you don't have access to the treatment and the things that will you as you like identify might help so then your experience you know like for you maybe you grew up in that environment but look at you now but it's much more difficult to break out of that class or or experience up with social mobility yeah, um, social mobility is a myth you, dude it's a myth and my uh social mobility hasn't changed like i don't I still earn worse than your average tradesman. Um, I just have visibility and, um, but. But you, you live, you have a family who own land. Uh, yeah, I have a dad that owns uh, land and I have a mom that's renting in Maroubra who raised me. We can't equate your experience with. I'm not talking about my experience. Of color who might have grown up in the same I'm not age. talking about my experience. I'm talking about the, the the lessons of Fred Hampton and Angela Davis, and I've I've cited so many people and, and so many different and and various Indigenous friends of mine, um, who've participated well in the workforce and come up against the same fucking torturous horseshit that every working class person puts up with. Um, I mean, I'm like I said, I'm from a part of the world where you've got La Perouse, you've got like the wharves, you've got like a Maroubra, you have these communities that are very multicultural and very proud of that fact and um really the lines of race are not stark in these communities because everyone's from the same class and we understand that and think, having people draw these talk- lines of division between us is it's neither accurate nor uh i feel like we need to helpful. talk about that in the, we need to talk about that maybe a little bit more in the past tense what's that uh I don't understand. All these communities have changed a lot and a lot of those Oh, big time. Yeah, they've been gentrified and these injuries. people yeah. of colour and white uh, alike have been moved out to the western suburbs now um, by uh, myself in, you know, included. I Freak, I got priced out of the eastern suburbs like uh, a long time ago. So, yeah, um, these economic forces don't discriminate. Trauma doesn't discriminate. And um, anyway, I guess... Where it did discriminate these economic forces was in the women's pay gap in the professional surfing realm. And uh, they've actually got you to thank for kind of kickstarting the movement to get women paid the same amount of money, uh, which I believe, uh, remind me, it was at, I know it was at a, a surfing contest, I believe on the northern beaches of Sydney and what what transpired exactly i might even play the grab the grab's classic i love that little clip (laughs) and i guess i mean what i'm more interested in really is not so much what prompted it because i think that's obvious but what the aftermath of that was uh and and yeah just talk us through the process i guess from that point to where we're at now with our female surfers getting the same amount as as men yeah, so it was a long lead-in, like not in the act itself, but in terms of like years of, you know, as you said, that I'm from like Jody Cooper country and I literally had no idea that Jody Cooper even existed when I was growing up because I'd never seen her anywhere. I I mean, I had surf mag subscriptions and she was never in them, so I didn't know. 
Um, I had heard of her, maybe. And then I feel like over the years of competing and realising that, um, that, you know, my peers and me sometimes were not being given the same amount of money and not given the same amount of media coverage and not given basically you know you win the same event as a man as a man and they they give the guy a trophy and they don't give you a trophy that's like that's something that would always happen or like somebody would get money and then you just get like I don't know a wetsuit and (laughs) this real frustration of going of thinking like how is this ever going to change and then finally and I had you know I had always I'd started writing and, and and I was writing surf stories and that kind of thing. And um, I was always trying to write about this stuff and it was hard to ever get anything published about the gender. People always just were like, oh, we're sick of that conversation about gender equality and inequality in surfing. And it was hard to, um, to ever really get it anywhere. And then in 2018, when WSL announced that they were having equal prize money that was like obviously a huge moment and I kind of in my mind thought like it's fixed now like we're done <laughs> equal prize money is surfing everywhere um I wrongly assumed and then um I guess it says a lot about how many surf contests I win because only two two and a half years later <laughs> um I won the curly male jam and I like I surfed in the final and came in didn't know if I'd won yet they didn't announce it and um I was standing with a couple of the other girls who were in the final and one of the girls um mom Donna she said oh um there's not equal prize money and I was like what that is so like no surfing has equal prize money now you know and so I went over to where they were setting up the um the prize giving with the big novelty checks and I just like pushed the checks aside and saw what the difference was. And the men's winner was had four thousand on their check and the women's winner had fifteen hundred. And so um I was sitting with the two other finalists, Kira and Tully, and we were going, okay, are we gonna call them out? Whoever's won is gonna have to call them out. And then Tully's like, maybe we should just go and talk to them. And they were like, oh, maybe we'll just contact them after. I don't know. Like, what should we do? And then the juniors went up and received their um, their prizes and they didn't give them the microphone. They just took the prize and they left. And so that was like, oh, we're not even going to have the chance to call them out because they're not doing speeches. And then so we went up and then I had won and they gave me the check. And then we start walking off and the MC goes, don't you think we should hear from our winner? And I was like, oh, God, <laughs> I'm going to do this, aren't I? And um, so then um, in my mind was um, don't say it, don't say anything, don't say it. And then um, I just said it. I just called them out. And I tried to do it politely because it was a pretty scary thing to do. And um, And then, yeah. I just had no grasp of what would would happen. I just had no, it was the only thing that I had thought what might happen was that if we put them on the spot, like the, if, because if we just talk to them, they're going to give us this bullshit excuse that they always give, that all these people always give is that there were less women in the draw, so there's less prize money. But I knew that there was only less, there were 16 men and there were 12 women and I was a late entry because I couldn't get a spot and I could only get a spot because someone pulled out because it was full. And I knew of a few other people who tried to enter who couldn't get a spot because it was full. So they, I was like, they're going to say, oh, there's less women, so there's less prize money, but they actually capped the entries to not let enough of women in, the equal amount of women in. So all I thought was if I just say this, then maybe when they're planning an event next time, they will think, oh, it's a bit awkward if we have any prize money again. So maybe we'll they will have it prize money next time. That was it. And I just didn't realize that it would be the hugely pivotal moment for me that it has been. Um, like the guys from the club didn't come up and say anything. Like the few women who were there and other competitors and stuff came up and were like, thank you. And like, 
you know, good on you for saying something. And I went home that night and I saw a friend and I told her what had happened and she said, um, oh, I wonder if you'll get any media out of this. And I was like, oh, no, like no one cares about that. I'm just going to turn the light on quickly, sorry. Um, no one cares about this. Like, I don't, like, I don't know, that, would, that wouldn't happen. I, I had the video of it and I didn't even post it. Like, I just didn't, I don't know. I was just like, oh, <laughs> like, just, yeah, no conception at all. And only like three days later, I posted the video on my Instagram and um, this this guy who's a photographer for the Sydney Morning Herald who followed me sent me a message and was like, hey, like, do you reckon you would want to talk to the, I'm going to send this to the SMH, like, do you want to, um, would you be happy to do an interview with them if they're interested in it? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. And, like, two minutes later, um, this journalist sends me a message and was like, hey, are you able to do an interview? And I was like, yeah, sure. And so I did the interview on the phone with her and she was like, oh, can you go down to the Maroubra and, like, do a photo shoot at 6 a.m. this morning? I was like, in the morning? And I was like, okay like that's pretty serious but sure and then she's like have, have you spoken to any other media about this and I was like no like why would I have spoken to anyone else about this still like so naive and so I did the photo shoot and then the story came out the following night online and and by that time like the video had started to like go off on socials and I was like well people are like really this is like resonating with some people and then that night, the SMH story came out online and, um, yeah, someone who works at WSL actually sent me a message and was like, holy shit, Lucy, it's the lead story on SMH. And I was like, oh, my God, like, this is serious. This is getting real. And it's, the next morning I woke up and I had an email from Channel 10 that were like, can you come into the studio at 8 a.m.? And I was like, Okay, and by this time, my socials had just, like, gone berserk and I was like, whoa, this is, like, fully viral. And so then I'm driving to Channel 10 and my phone's just, like, ringing. It's, like, ABC, Channel 7, like, all these different media. And going into Channel 10 and and then I, I went into I didn't even know how to get out of the underground car park. Like, I was trying to, I was, like, stuck in the car park, don't know where to go. Finally get up there. No one talks to me. No one says anything. I'm just sitting on this chair. They just mic me up. And I was like, what's going to happen? There was just no one. And then I could just see, like, the live show going on. And then the producer comes over and is like, you're on right, right in 30 seconds. And I'm just, like, live on the couch on Channel 10. And, um... And so I'm walking up and the hosts were like, Lucy, how are you? And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty nervous. And they're like, you're a baller. And what was really cool actually <laughs> is that. <laughs> is that a direct quote? <laughs> yeah, that was actually what one of those hosts said, those people with really white teeth and stuff. And um, It's so weird when you get up close to them and they've got that weird like Ella Bache just cake face mm -hmm. thing going on. It's a trip out. You're yeah. like, holy shit, that's what you got to have on your head to be on telly. Yeah, and then you see them on telly and you're like, oh, yeah, they look normal. And then that tells you how warped our perceptions are. Yeah, and you see yourself and you're all splotchy-faced and fucked yeah. up. You're like, what the hell? They stooge <laughs> me with the El cake face. <laughs> totally. It was, yeah. I mean, also I, like, I had this, like, turtleneck dress on and there's, like, nowhere to put the tuck the mic thing in, like the mm. bit that they put that wire down here. And then I'm just, like, holding Fuck. my... You didn't get Weinsteined by the, the boom mic guy, did you? Oh, I'm just uh, adjusting the mic. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was pretty weird. But um, I just started this, like, I don't know. It was like, it was, when I, even when I think about it now, almost two years later, I'm like, I just can't believe that happened. I went to the freaking project. I went, <laughs> I left, um, I left Channel 10 and, and I did like, I don't know, I was like talking to Richard Glover on ABC. And then um, finally I saw the Sydney Morning Herald and I was on the front cover and I was like, oh, okay, I see. And the headline was, um, we're not daffodils. <laughs> wow, that's staunch. That was, that's some Angela Davis shit right there. That was, Are you my, kidding? That was my quote, yeah. Pretty, um, I mean, freedom is a constant struggle, isn't it? <laughs> Right on. 
Um, and yeah, then somebody um, wonderful, some CEO of some corporation, I don't know, called up and was like, I heard you on ABC and I want to give you donate the, the extra prize money. So we can manage to even up the prize money that year. And then um, Surfing Australia very quickly were not into the negative press. So um, just like that, they changed the rule book so that you have to have equal prize money for anything affiliated with Surfing Australia, which is funny after, um, I don't know how long Surfing Australia has existed, but um, after so many years that they, I think it's it took 24 hours and they changed the book. <laughs> It's an interesting case study on exactly what we were just talking about too. Just the way a corporation will bankroll uh, women surfing so it's equal, right? And mm. that's a great thing. But there's no real discussion about uh, bankrolling women, like the mass of women in the workforce uh, into a position where they can easily buy homes uh, on their own or you know, easily uh, just have a comfortable life, work three to four days a week take care of their children and um, there's no, no this conversation doesn't happen what uh, the corporate culture does is it elevates those already in the limelight into positions of equality and it casts this kind of uh, hologram or this uh this this facade that that equality trickles mm -hmm. down into the rest of the culture and uh, the society where it, it clearly doesn't so it's it's just a token gesture by a corporation um makes them look good uh, adds to this kind of falsity that society is equal when uh, it still isn't. Yeah, and I think also, like, I'm immensely aware of the fact that things probably would have been very different had I done it if I was a woman of colour. I think the fact that I um, am already from a, a cut of society that is favoured by many corporations um, probably worked a lot in um, determining the outcome and the response. Um, so, yeah, I think it is totally that. I mean, it is It is just like corporations using human beings as billboards to um, further exploit their work workers in terms to, to expand corporate profits and put more money into the pockets of CEOs. And we as surfers are just out there doing the good work of Jesus and um, carrying forward the corporate message. <laughs> oh, well, as, uh, <laughs> look, as long as you've got enough money to get back to uh, Madagascar or tofu or freaking, uh, I don't know, where, where yeah, else? Yeah, I, I have a full-time job, so I can't. Oh, yeah, you're working for a politician now. What's the deal? You I know. For a, where, do I, where do I fit in the strata of, of capitalism when I work in a job that doesn't um, operate on profit? Well, maybe it does. I mean, it is part of the machinery of the government, I guess. Um, mm. But, yeah, I work for a Greens MP called Sue Higginson. Um, mm. She is from Lismore, actually. Fucking oath. That is battler country, man. She she will get it. She Lismore, I have all the respect in the world for people from that joint. And you talk about multicultural uh, areas where there is a shared circumstance in the form of mm. poverty, floods and hardship that is a uh th th that's top of the list in this country i mean i've been all over it and there's not many places that have as much character and as as much hardship mm -hmm. as there's more yeah and sue is um i mean she is she's pretty um impressive she's just a pretty impressive human being and in, in what she is in, in what she does and it's pretty amazing opportunity for me to um be working on her political goals, which basically are she's cl clambered out of some rainforest somewhere where she was like locking onto logging um, machinery, trying to protect old growth growth forests in the 1990s, and then um, she became an environ lawyer and headed up the Environmental Defenders Office as kind of like one of Australia's most prolific environmental lawyers. She sued. She sued Santos. She sued the New South Wales government. She's shut down coal mines and busted protesters out of pits in the ground and in the north in northern New South Wales and um, had a long career doing that. And now she's in the New South Wales Parliament, um, still trying to end native forest logging. And um, 
And there's me with no legal training writing the law. That's what I do sometimes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's interesting. I remember back when I was living in Sydney and working as a journalist and what I would write about was uh, just the, the fundamental levers of capitalism, namely like housing and rent and uh, gentrification and these kinds of things. And uh, I also, at one point, I went up to uh, Pauline Hanson country, like uh, kind of Toowoomba to Ipswich. Mm -hmm. and I drove around for an entire day talking to Pauline Hanson supporters and I came back to Sydney and the Greens used to have, uh, I mean, for our international listeners, the Greens are like, I guess, the um, they're the far left-wing party. Let's put it that way. Um, and the Greens used to have this like meetup, this public kind of uh, town hall at uh, the Gaelic Club in uh, just near Central Station there. And I thought, uh, I'm just going to go in there and, and tell them what I learned on this trip. You know, um, always had a, kind of a soft spot for the greens. Uh, you know, my mom votes greens and, you know, a, a lot of their policies are on point. They uh, really understand the need for rent control and um, house prices and protecting the environment and so on and so forth. And what I discovered when I was talking to all of Pauline Hanson's supporters and just the people in that area was that, Pauline Hanson is, I guess, like uh, for international listeners, the far right uh, candidate in a sense. Um, but what I realized was all the people in that part of the world, they were just disenfranchised working class people from dying towns uh, who fucking hated the mainstream political establishment. And uh, some of them were dairy farmers. Um, you know, a lot of them were just like, people who were yeah trying to find work in dying towns and um and who just believed politics and the media were corrupt which it is generally <laughs> and so i this is what i told the people at the greens i think uh david shoebridge was there and uh he was like i don't know whatever he is like the the, the, head, the yeah, state I guy to, i used to work for david shoebridge actually i worked on his election campaign now he's in the senate yeah and uh yeah. lee rianon i love lee rianon there was actually a um a bit of a, a contest for the leadership at that point. Lee Rhiannon was, is the daughter of a coal miner from the South Coast, probably Wollongong or something, the Illawarra. Um, Jenny Leong was there. Jeremy Buckingham was there and a few other people. And I'll never forget it because I, I went in there and I said, like, you know, these people could just as easily be voting for you guys. Uh, but the reason they're not is because your name is mud in working class communities. And... um. I don't exactly know why that is, but it is what it is. And I uh, had some people, I won't name names, staring absolute fucking daggers at me. And uh, I also had Lee Rhiannon frother. Like she believed the exact same thing I believed. Um, mm. But I mean, uh, moving forward, uh, in a lot of ways, it, it seems like the, the Greens are the, the only party that's, speaking real sense in terms of you know just moving towards universal basic incomes like uh you know being real custodians of the environment uh rent control just all of these really fucking painfully obvious measures that will level out life i mean you know kind of hopefully push us more towards the the socialist democratic nations of Northern Europe, the fucking, you know, most wealthy and advanced people uh, on earth are, are socialists. Uh, it's not like a dirty word uh, as it's often portrayed by the American media model and elsewhere. So yeah, it's disappointing to not see the Greens ever really get traction in those in amongst the working masses. I uh, mm. don't know why that is. It's heartening to see that, um, we have a guy from Housing Commission who's the Prime Minister. I don't know many countries in the world where that would be possible, but uh, yeah, it would be good if he it would be good if he uh, if he didn't shut the door behind him as he experienced his way to the top. That would be wonderful. Thank you, Albo. You should raise the uh, um, welfare payments to at least be livable. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's frick. Yeah, that's a yeah. So that's a whole. Uh, that's a big can of worms but um the greens like where are they at now and uh you know how, how long until how long do we gotta wait until they uh you know have more of a, a foothold in in mainstream politics 
Yeah, I think um, it's so like that point about the kind of regional places and the, the people that are completely disenfranchised by mainstream politics um, and ignored and 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 it, it's like it's a similar it's a, it's the pr same principle that kind of got Donald Trump elected, right? It's these people who feel like they have been abandoned by th these elitists who have they come from a political class and. Um, political and media class and they step into these positions of power and speak in a language with policies that are not applicable or relevant and um and, and they're right you know, <laughs> it's uh, just and they're right yeah it's yeah, just they're two right. sides they, of the they're absolutely right and it's like it oh yeah I don't have the answer to it but I think somebody like Pauline Hansen and or Donald Trump to the extreme or maybe the same I don't know um could appeal to people because they don't speak and act and appear to come from a place like that. Um, but, and I think that the Greens struggle with that and communicating policies in a way that actually makes sense to people. Mm, too much um, time in universities, not enough time on the end of shovels on building sites. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Well, my dad used to be- or fish and chip shops in Poland. My Nancy's dad used case. to be a Nats voter. And now he's a Greens voter. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I, that was what I was running into up around yeah. Toowoomba was, was that. And he's, um, I mean, he's somebody that's worked very, very hard for a very long time. And um, interestingly, during the federal election, when the Greens announced their 10 year, like their policy to basically to get Australia out of coal and gas and um, like a 10 year transition plan for workers that you'll be paid a subsidy for 10 years after you like after you the coal mine that you work in or the whatever the fossil fuel industry that you work in closed down and when my dad heard that policy he said that is the first time i've actually heard a plan like what's actually going to happen because he's like in my hometown growing up everybody worked in the mines like as the, the common experience in western australia everybody it like is fly and fly out to the mines and to to know how dependent the economy is on that um and to know that the the there is a risk a very real um thing that we're facing that it's not going to last forever if you're working coal mines particularly in new south wales where that is um a huge industry to see an actual real plan for dad was like the most um I, I feel like he just found that a really important moment in politics because there was somebody speaking his language to him. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like it was the policies that made him vote Greens, but it was probably just because his daughter was working for the freaking Greens. But my <laughs> my first experience with the Greens was um, when I was, like, 15 and I was surfing at Ocean Beach and there was somebody from my hometown who was a Greens member in the Best Australian Upper House, Paul Llewellyn. And um, he surfed. And one day um, I was out in the surf. He was out there. We were the only two people out. And then he burnt me. He dropped in on me. A oh, classic self-serving elite. I know. That's left of politics for you. You have to bloody share the friggin' waves. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so I came in and I was like, I am never voting for the Greens. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's, yeah, it's this poor policy, clearly. It's a terrible framework. <laughs> um, all this equality, oh, my goodness. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, I obviously didn't stick to that. But um, it's cool. I feel like getting to know the ins inner workings of the Greens and realising that even though there is perhaps an, a, an outside perception of the Greens as this a, a, a sort of a quite elite cut of people trying to preach um, progressive politics that being part of like a Greens New South Wales team and being like just being part of the membership of realising that the Greens is actually a home for a lot of people who find no other home in politics. Mm. And it's basically like, yeah, that like there is, there isn't, there is, it's like sometimes working for the Greens is like teaching chickens how to do macrame or like, I don't know, it's the most dysfunctional organised chaos. But there is, there are so many people that 
um, are with that are have a place in the greens and have a home in the greens that um, probably would not have a place in any other political party. And I feel like that's really cool. And it is a party of young people too. Like even though a lot of the elected members are not particularly young, the membership and the people working for the greens is like hugely young people um, and hugely diverse. And mm. um, it's pretty cool in that way. Like they could do with just some more rough around the edges, working class grinders in the party. But the, the sad fact about both media and politics is that elites, they don't want to give up their roles in these institutions because they don't want to go and join the fucking working class. Mm-hmm. They're not of that class. They don't want to go, they don't want to go near it. They're, they're, their whole objective in life really is just to continue uh, working in the fairly well-paid leisurely air-conditioned offices and uh, knowledge professions at the expense of the objectives of their party. Like really that's what seems to come first. You know, it's, it's almost like a, a universal human trait to, to put your own interests before others. Uh, and politics is no difference. I just wonder what the greens would look like if they had, you know, a, a, so, a freaking social, like a, a Stan Grant, like a guy who's indigenous uh, and white and grew up working class. Actually, Some... actually, there is there actually is a really awesome Aboriginal woman called Linda Jean Co who grew up in the Central West, who's from like a long line of um, First Nations activists who have done some pretty groundbreaking shit and taking on the political establishment. She's an activist. She's like deep in the grassroots Black Liberation Movement, and she's yeah. the Greens, and that's, she's in win- winnable. That's spot. not what yeah, I'm talking it. about, though. I mean, as as good as that is, I I mean someone who's like uh, able to bridge that divide. You know, who comes from. Um, not not an activist, but who's a worker, I guess, uh, and not necessarily black or white is irrelevant to me. I feel like um, activists are also workers. Mm. Activists can be workers. They can be for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, many workers are activists. Yeah, that's right. That's it. That's it. I, I don't know what her story is, but man, all the best. Like I. F- Oh, yeah. I don't know what it's going to take to to push the greens to that that next level, but man, Albo is an inner city Hauso guy. Like he's basically a green. Uh, that's I reckon. Like parties. I mean, environmentally, maybe not so much, but that's just the reality of being a mainstream politician. Is that you have corporate resource oligarchs uh, mm-hmm. dangling your career in front of you constantly, and if you do want to throw some giant mining tax at them they uh your own party will stab you in the back instantly which we saw happen with uh kevin rudd crud yeah and i mean it's probably that's also probably a biggest a big limitation um for the greens in new south wales particularly um because they don't take corporate donations of any kind and you can only donate six thousand dollars to the greens if you ever want to hmm. so there's a huge resource limit on what you can actually mm-hmm. do with that um it's great all point. That volunteers and um that type of thing and um yeah i feel like politics is a crazy fucking hectic world and i work inside i'm employed i'm not employed by the greens i'm employed by the new south wales parliament as a like a um policy advisor and parliamentary secretary so my office is inside parliament i walk around with all these liberal folks around and um all these people who it's like just like working in a workplace in an office where there's all these people who you just it's not just that you have some kind of rival you have this open public like adversity to each other so <laughs> it's very strange dynamic. And I think like, I think a huge part of the whole issue with politics itself is it's not just about um, who gets into the place, but it's what the place does to people, mm. once you're, you know? So like maybe like Albo's story into where he is now um, is a good one. And it is amazing that he is where he is now, but he has been in politics for more than 20 years. Mm. So he is institutionalised, as they all are, and it, it's so much about 
like when we when you're trying to like launching equal pay for equal play which is the campaign that i launched after um the curly male jam thing and that was sort of my first contact with like activism and advocacy and political people and ministers and things and um and realizing like knowing now that when you're trying to push these people to make change so much of what they're going to do is actually just ruled by like factional politics within their own party with their in their relationships they have with other people across the party lines and inside the parliament that that is all the things that come into play into their decision making and realizing like how hard it is to make change because those like MPs are not just a individual as they are, as you might think. Like they're part of a political machinery that, as just a person, you don't have access to. Of course, and I completely but, get that. Yeah. But as many many people, we do have access to, and that's basically the only <laughs> the only thing that we can do is shame people in the media, create electoral risk that they might lose their seat if they think they might lose their seat if they don't do what you're asking, or just have like such broad community pressure that um that kind of functions in achieving those things and and people start to to listen up and pay attention Mm. factional politics is there two more depressing words in the english language fucking hell what a what a stupid what stupid terminology and what fucking dimwits (laughs) uh, that we have uh just i know i know know, suits and ties fucking zhuzhing around these air-conditioned offices just pissing time up the wall uh piss and by time i mean money because it's the same fucking thing and uh like meanwhile- Rihanna, who you mentioned before she told me once that like when she was in when she was a senator that you could go to canberra and not see a single normal normal person who isn't another politician like you go to the airport, you get on your flight and you land in Canberra, you get picked up by a driver, you go to Parliament House, you've got everything inside Parliament House. There's food in there, there's drinks in there, there's your job in there, there's your team who works for you in there. Then you go and you stay in your hotel where people serve you there and then you go back and you do that for two weeks of sitting and then you go on a plane where people serve you on the plane and you go home and that's your life. Frick, man. How do we rattle their cage, Lucy? How do we get up in their face and, you know, shake them down for a bit of extra loot for the indebted masses? I mean, is there, is there not some celebrity football game? I saw Pocock playing some celebrity football game. Maybe you could sneak me into one of those and I could just fucking crease Dutton, just a, an old fashioned, just jam in on him and just Don't absolutely fold him. David Pocock sees um, lots of normal people when he's like um, going for his nude swims in the morning or whatever it is. <laughs> Nude swims his, in camera. His his, his beat his, his morning beat test or something. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, dude, I'll have to leave it there. But uh, thanks so much. Appreciate your time. What a wild story. I I must say I I wasn't aware of just the intrepid nature of everywhere you've been and, and just the the way in which you've traveled the world surfing. It's so admirable. Far out. Uh, for a woman, incredibly brave. It uh, must be said, I think, um, despite, you know, the, the lack of uh, kind of dangerous episodes that you endured along the way, you know, it was safer oh, than... There, there have been some, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And we didn't even get to talk about Israel and Palestine. I'm sure you got a freaking... I'm sure you got a solution for that too. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's Palestinian self-determination, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it's got to be. It's an apartheid state. Shame, Israel. Fucking jokers, yeah, mate. Yeah, turf them out. Free Palestine. We're not free until Palestine's free. That's what it really is. Yeah. You now you watch the amount of advertisers that pull out over that. Oh, yeah. anyway. Are, are we serving corporate interests? Not me. I'm trying not to anyway. But yeah. Oh, you're doing a pretty good job. It's uh not not easy unless you want to be poor. Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Thank you, Lucy.